Good morning. Hello. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm so thrilled to be back talking to Nick Vaughan of NV Health today. Um, we've already done one talk all about what should be on your nutritional plate in midlife. And we realized during that talk, there's, there's so much to talk about um, in regard to nutrition in midlife because it affects absolutely everything. Um, so we decided to come back for a couple of more in-depth talks about specific subjects. And today it's all about the gut biome. And so welcome, Nick. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself for those who didn't make the last talk? Yeah. Uh, and then maybe give us a little bit of a, uh, a an overview of what we're wanting to talk about today. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me again, Linda. I love connecting with you women. Um, so I'm Nick Vaughan. I am a registered nutritional therapist, which means that I practice one-to-one -one nutritional therapy with people who have got all kinds of different complex chronic conditions, quite often people who've been a little bit forgotten about in terms of medical help. And we can then look at underlying imbalances in maybe hormones, maybe stress, maybe nutrition. So it covers nutrition and lifestyle. Um, but I'm very much a scientist. So I love understanding the why. I love deeping, de digging really deep into why people are suffering with IBS, why people are suffering with autoimmune conditions, etc. And so I've got a passion for all things women's health as well, being in midlife myself, going through all of these things myself. You know, I'm learning so much. It's my journey as well. Um, but more and more, I'm realizing that so many of the aspects of perimenopause that we will outline today, you know, are interfered with by our gut microbiome. And this is an area of research which is just absolutely exploding. There was something in the region of 50 to 55,000 papers published just in the area of gut and the microbiome in the last five years alone. It is, you know, we think about how much we thought we knew about the human body. We're only just discovering now how much we don't know <laughs> about our gut, but how our gut is so responsible for influencing our hormones, influencing our neurotransmitters, so our mood, synthesizing our vitamins, you know, so much of this is all down to the gut microbiome. So um, yeah, I'm really excited. And today what we'll do is I'll do a little bit of an intro over what the gut microbiome is. So I'm going to touch on three aspects, three perhaps terms that you might have come across. So the term dysbiosis, what does that mean? You know, what is an imbalanced microbiome? We can talk about inflammation because that comes up pretty much everywhere. What a buzzword, but what does it actually mean when it comes to our gut? And we'll talk a little bit about leaky gut because that again is something that actually, as we start to lose our female hormones, you know, we become much more susceptible to leaky gut. And what does that then mean for us, you know, for overall health? And we can talk about some of the more common perimenopausal symptoms that we might all be experiencing. And I'll tie that back to the gut and your gut health so we can understand and you can try and make some of those connections. And then we'll end with our little checklist. I've got some ideas about the absolute must haves and the please don'ts um, <laughs> in terms of, you know, our good gut health um, and any questions. I don't know how you want to do it, Linda, if you want to be interrupted, yeah, you can go along or, you know, we can. My brain's going, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah, there's yeah, so much. Know, I just sort of thought, golly, I remember so clearly 15 years ago now when my son, you know, sitting in a pediatrician's office with my son and me talking mm -hmm. about, we've got to sort out his gut and things and the, him saying, this whole gut brain thing you keep going on about, there's no scientific research into this. And you just need to forget about this whole hocus pocus probiotic thing. And I, yeah. So, wow, we have come yeah. such a long way. And like you say, now it's just like the floodgates are open. And especially mm. because women's health has become such a, um, a spotlight and driven very much by women here in the UK uh, worldwide, which is brilliant. And, you know, I, for me, one of my very first perimenopausal symptoms 
was a much worsening of IBS of gut issues and as our progesterone starts to drop down at the beginning of our perimenopausal journey often quite a few years before our estrogen starts to drop away a lot of women because the progesterone is so incredibly important in the gut lining and the function of the gut lining um yeah gut issues are of an initial indication of perimenopause so um i think we can't have a conversation about symptom management and getting to be as well as we possibly can be in this very significant life phase which will set us up for the rest of our lives if we're not talking about healing the gut yeah so. too true too true i mean we've got more bacterial dna than we have our own dna yeah. you know like let that sink in that's absolutely bonkers so we've got so much our, our microbes have got so much influence over how to help us reduce inflammation how to how to regulate our stress how to give us our good mood you know when we've got a friendly microbiome it will help us you know on that in that way so um but Can you conversely, just tell, tell us yeah. very broadly what is the microflora like what is the gut biome and then what can happen especially in that early phase of of um perimenopause what can actually happen to the gut yeah so we're talking predominantly here about bacteria species of which there are thousands upon thousands but they're bacterial species that are resident in predominantly our large intestine but we do naturally have some in our small intestine as well we shouldn't have too many. They can become slightly overgrown and that leads to worsening of things like IBS and small bacterial, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. But we have got this. Yes. <laughs> it's, 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 it's yeah. Really many parts. yeah, exactly. But we those microbes, they they were there from our mother when we were kind of being created in the womb. We were there. They, they develop as we enter into the world and the first thousand days of our life are super influential over the, what the shape of that microbiome looks like, but it's not static. And all of the time, those microbes that are living in our, predominantly our large intestine, they're influenced by the foods we eat, the type of foods we're eating, our stress levels. So cortisol will create overgrowths of certain, what we call opportunistic, bacteria that are there just sitting there waiting for our immune system to be a little bit hampered by stress so our microbes are influenced by toxins by medications you know you think of antibiotic use but also anti-inflammatories you know which are used so frequently so our microbiome consists of helpful bacteria which we often call commensals and harmful bacteria which often will be living there that's that's absolutely fine but our immune system is there to sort them out and we we often talk about our microbiome as a bit of a car park in our gut with a certain number of allocated spaces and provided we have got enough cars of, of the healthy helpful bacteria residing in those car parking spaces there's no room for the more harmful bacteria to reside you know there's no car parking spaces for them but if we don't have enough of the helpful bacteria in our gut and there are a few absolute they're called keystone species they are a few species of bacteria which have been shown in studies to be pivotal for good health and if we don't have these special species of bacteria then these opportunistic bacteria, harmful bacteria can get hold. And, th and then we have our problems, which we'll talk about with our aches and pains and our inflammation and our IBS and our constipation. You know, all of that can come back to an imbalance in bacteria and some pretty nasty stuff as well. You know, some autoimmune conditions are directly linked to more harmful bacteria like Klebsiella, for example, which have taken hold in the gut and contribute to autoimmunity so it's yeah. definitely something that we need to foster nurture is i was reading lara bryden's stuff about um endometriosis 
and that being linked very much to I reckon most people with endometriosis do have this um, quite vast imbalance in the gut microbiome. Mm. I love yeah. your car park analogy. So I was in my mind, I'm like, oh, the you know the leaded, big old leaded, uh, leaded petrol vehicles kind of right? yeah. get into the spaces instead yeah. of I don't know the electric or the <laughs> yeah the, the little smart, smart cars. So yes, um, <laughs> how interesting. So um, what are the foods? What are the lifestyle things that can can get us into this imbalance? um and and what talk to us a bit more about what can be the results like what things can we be seeing manifest from that microbiome becoming more and more imbalanced and maybe you could just touch on why in particular in midlife once the progesterone is dropping and then once our estrogen starts to drop away as well because i think yes yeah, that's yeah what we see well in terms of what really influences our microbes so the good bacteria they love diversity they love fiber so let's not forget where they live so they live in our large intestine and when we think of our gut function your stomach is the first one well, actually it's your mouth is the first thing isn't it to chew up things but let's go straight down into the stomach the stomach is where you know if you've got really kind of healthy levels of um hydrochloric acid, stomach acid, they will neutralize a lot of the bad bacteria before it even enters into our intestine. So that's great. Um, but then you've got the, the small intestine, which really um, is there to digest a lot of your carbohydrates and take extract nutrients from your food, but anything that's not digested in the small intestine. So I'm talking largely fiber here you know, that's not really very well digested in the small intestine, that goes into your colon, your large intestine, where it feeds our microbes. And feeding our microbes with fiber is so, so important. And it's important for so many reasons, not least of all in terms of healthy hormone metabolism. So when we think about in kind of the early part of perimenopause, when you've got the what time kind of estrogen dipping up and down, up and down, up and down, what our healthy microbiome will help to do is actually metabolize the estrogen and help clear the estrogen. And if you've not got the right microbes there, then the less helpful microbes, when your estrogen is all nicely packaged up by your liver, ready to be excreted in stool, if you've got an overgrowth of bacteria that can what's called deconjugate that estrogen, can break it apart and send it back into the circulation ready to go again, some of those symptoms of heavy periods and migraines and these symptoms of kind of high estrogen can become so much worse as a result of bacteria that are breaking apart the estrogens and, and getting back again. So fiber is so helpful when that's, it comes oh, I was just gonna jump, jump in there because I think that's, for me, understanding this part was, was really, really important. So I just want to re repeat it. And, and you tell me if I'm understanding it correctly. And, and ladies, um, do jump in if you've got any questions here, because I think this is really super important. So what, um, what's being said is that the the fiber part of our diet and it has to be a very diverse uh contribution of fiber is going to help us basically not get constipated and when if we are constipated if we do have too much of the bad bacteria in our in our guts um what can happen is rather than the estrogen getting flushed out with your poo it can start, it can get deconjugated, the word. That's it, yeah. It can be absorbed. And then it's when we get estrogen dominance. And that's not a good thing. That's when you start to get that tire of fat around your belly and you start to get fat on the organs and that, that's visceral fat and that's, that's the more dangerous fat. That estrogen dominance is what can contribute to a, a, um, a, a, a more likely to activate breast cancer cells. Um, so what Nick's saying here is so incredibly important that we make sure in midlife, the pathways are doing what they're supposed to do when we're able to detoxify. Once the estrogen has done its job, 
get it out of the system because what we don't yeah. want it is to have it recirculating and then getting that estrogen imbalance and that's when we can have all sorts of hormonal havoc is that can is that sort Abs of yeah absolutely with estrogen you want to use it and lose it you know so we want to make all the benefit of having estrogen because it's it's great um but we want to then eliminate it and eliminating it it's really really important and if we don't have good bowel function we're not going to eliminate it and it's our microbes in our gut that help with peristalsis so that kind of contraction of our smooth muscle in the colon that's really important for good elimination of our stool so yes really important and really then also important. squatty potty and, and squatty, yes and posture things in yoga and relaxation and all those things that's all going to help with constipation as well isn't it yeah so some of the other things perhaps which kind of if we're talking about things that can go wrong obviously you've got this imbalance of microbiome your car the car parking analogy of an overgrowth of bacteria that's going to contribute to maybe constipation and unhelpful estrogen metabolism but also unhelpful bacteria in our gut they can contribute to what's called leaky leaky gut so they can actually damage the gut lining itself and in perimenopause we're also susceptible because estrogen plays this lovely role of helping maintain that um, integrity of your gut lining so our our gut cells if you imagine there's you've got a tube the gut your gut is like this one big tube right from mouth to anus one big tube and in that you are ingesting toxins, medications, antibiotics, all sorts, you're ingesting food. And what is separating, when you come to your gut, what is separating all of that from your bloodstream is a single layer of cells. It's crazy, but it's a single layer of cells. And That's these crazy. cells- One layer of cells. One layer of cells. You think about your skin, it's got like seven, and this yeah. is one layer of cells. Now they're held together with what's called tight junctions. So if you imagine, you know, the cells of your gut are really nicely tight together, but and they're 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 glued with these proteins, um, which we, we know as, as called tight junctions. And these tight junctions can become quite easily broken. We can fix them, that's fine, but they can become quite easily damaged. Alcohol is probably a number one damager of those tight junctions. So the metabolite of alcohol called acetyl aldehyde is really toxic to those tight junctions. So we're particularly susceptible if in perimenopause, when we've got towards the, you know, when we've got that kind of lower function of those hormones that are going to be helping with the mucous membranes and the integrity of our gut lining, that's all becoming a bit compromised as we transition through menopause. We then throw in the fact that we might be drinking a little bit more and then thinking, well, I'm really not kind of coping with my alcohol in the same way as I used to. It's because your liver is under a lot of stress because it's working through so many more hormones that are needing to detoxify. But then you kind of add in that fact that you're going to be then breaking apart those tight junctions from the alcohol metabolite. And when we break apart those tight junctions, any of those more harmful metabolites that we have ingested, any food proteins perhaps that we've not digested properly, they enter our bloodstream and they promote inflammation and they promote what is this immune response. And that's why we can have more allergies it's why we can have more aches and pains you know these are all signs of imbalance in our immune function and leaky gut you know and leaky gut kind of if you kind of wind back as to why we get leaky gut if we've not got the right microbes there that are helping produce lovely short chain fatty acids that are going to be really healing for our gut epithelial cells you know we're more and more likely to become vulnerable to the potential of damaging that really important kind of uh layer so mm. yeah perhaps well, we can yeah mind-blowing isn't it when you when you 
really understand that here we are in a phase where we simply do not have the the protective hormones anymore, even if you're on HRT, it's not going to bring up the same level of protection that we had in our 20s and our 30s. So yes, we don't want to have estrogen dominance. So we do need, like you say, we need to use it and then we need to lose it, get rid of it. But our estrogen when we're younger still, it, it helps to keep the gut lining nice and, you know, strong, if you like, those, those junctions strong. And when they start to pull apart because we a we don't have as much of that estrogen and b maybe we're drinking a bit more or maybe we're just you know we're knackered and so we're eating more of the carbohydrates um i know you know for for, for me a lot of women casein dairy products and and gluten so wheat products those molecular structure of, of those products are, are quite similar aren't they? and they and i know they yeah. can go through the gut lining a bit more easily than some other proteins or some other Molecule. Well, they damage. So those proteins can damage those tight junctions. So, and then the proteins can escape. So yeah, the you've hit the nail on the head, you know, gluten and, and A1 casein are, you know, probably two of the biggest culprits when it comes to triggering food sensitivities, you know. Mm. So, so once yeah. these molecules get into our bloodstream, Talk mm. a little bit about, you know, like going into the, you know, the going past the blood, uh, what is it called? The brain, blood brain barrier and, oh, yeah. and into the joints and stuff. Cause I think so many of us go, my God, I'm so achy and stiff and brain fog. And yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm a hundred years old. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. I mean, all of these things. So being achy, stiff, brain fog, you know, that it could all be linked into inflammation. So what is, what is inflammation? You know, we hear about it so much. So inflammation is a very, very natural response that your body has to largely injury, really. Um, and it involves immune cells and it in involves chemicals that are produced by cells to mount an attack, to fix things, to kind of create like recruitment of cells to a particular area to promote blood flow and things like that so when we think about I'll take take aches and pains first of all so we've got this leaky gut situation which is super super common and we have then got immune cells that are residing just just at that border so I talk about your tube and then you've got the single layer of cells and just at the border between all of that and your bloodstream, you've got your immune cells, you've got dendritic cells, which are there all the time surveying because they are wanting to check you've not ingested, I don't know, like some horrific virus that your body just won't want, yeah? So immune cells are residing in your gut for a really, really important reason. But when they see food particles that are perhaps kind of then entering into your bloodstream or perhaps we talk about our unhelpful bacteria the unhelpful bacteria are gram negative bacteria so they look different under the microscope on their outer membranes they've got something called lipopolysaccharides lps and they break off and they enter into your your bloodstream which triggers a huge immune response so what is this immune response? Inflammation is this immune response when you get to your joints and it's these chemical messages of help. I think I need to sort something out here. We've got something which is foreign that is in our bloodstream that we don't really want to be in our bloodstream. Our immune system doesn't know that it's just a little bit of food protein, you know, or if it's just you know, like some little toxin that actually we don't need to worry about too much or a bit of pollen that we really should be calm about our immune system in certain cases doesn't know the difference and so it recruits these inflammatory molecules these these chemicals which are going to kind of increase blood flow make us have perhaps itchy skin and eczema make us have swollen joints and in the brain you know when these inflammatory chemicals 
enter and cross over the blood brain barrier and they activate what are called microglial cells, which are in our brains. There are immune cells in our brains and that triggers inflammation and, and interferes with the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. And, you know, you think about our stress axis and all of a sudden things become quite overwhelming or we're very anxious, you know, all of it can be tracked back to the impact of a leaky gut, a dysbiotic microbiome producing some of these end products that are not very helpful, food sensitivities, which perhaps we shouldn't really be having, you know, so. Mm, that's, yeah. Then when you think about the, you know, the, the, it's a, it's a vicious triangle, isn't it? Because you've got the, the, um, the, the trauma response, if you like, and then the inflammation, and then the aches and pains, the stiffness, the overwhelm, the foggy brain, which kind of triggers more of a stress response. And we're putting on more and more busyness and lack of sleep as well, and probably eating even more of the wrong foods, not doing our relaxing yoga girls. Mm -hmm. um, and then, <laughs> and that keeps us in that stress. And of course, that means that our, our we're not, our adrenals are producing more stress hormones and not more progesterone and estrogen. Therefore, gut is not healing. It's getting more leaky. We're getting more susceptible. It's, you can see what a very vicious cycle a breaking down cycle you can get into very easily yeah, absolutely and our immune system is responsible for so much you know our immune system that largely resides in our gut you know our immune cells are not only residing there they're they're the kind of immune cells that we have are influenced by our microbes that are in our gut they're in a constant communication all the time so we think of things like, you know, in your 40s, suddenly having hay fever, you know, suddenly developing allergies, suddenly developing food sensitivities. These things are an overactivation of a certain type of immune cell. So we have T cells, which we all know about now after COVID. We've all heard of what a T cell and a B cell is, but these are cells in our immune system that are there residing in our gut. And we have helper T cells that are there and they're influenced by our microbes and an over dominance of a particular type of microbe, a particular type of helper T cell disposes us then to having more allergic type of reactions to things because our immune system is not in balance and we can influence how our immune system needs to be in balance by our foods that we're eating but you know sometimes we have to go much further than that and look at therapeutics which is what I really love getting involved in when it comes to kind of therapeutic doses of supplements that can then help influence that balance of your immune cells that are, are there residing in your gut but you know we think about histamine in particular you know this is one of the immune cells that is is created we have histamine receptors in our brain linked into anxiety for example you know we have histamine receptors in our gut we have histamine receptors in our cell in our skin and the histamine tying it back to menopause and female health you know histamine and estrogen have got such a close relationship you know excess histamine can trigger excess estrogen excess estrogen can trigger excess histamine you know and so so often when we think about some of the menopausal complications that we have some menopausal symptoms of perhaps estrogen dominance you know is it estrogen dominance or is it that we've got an imbalanced immune response and we've got histamine excess you know some women do so well by like having another look at the foods that they're eating and seeing you know have we got like some histamine excess that's going on here that's perhaps contributing to the migraines and that communication with estrogen so it's fascinating you really kind of it takes so long to like dig into all of these things but and it's making me think how you know if and when if you do get into a situation like I did in 2019 where there was 
uh, just a cascade of perimenopausal symptoms and I was in a very highly stressed state etc and I had this you know this sort of all system breakdown um, and for me at that time alongside all of the therapeutic work I was doing I uh, got on body identical HRT and I can see that, okay, so initially, anyway, when your hormones are all over the place and maybe, you know, you're massively estrogen dominant, which I think was my case, actually, and progesterone was too low, um, getting in those body identical hormones would help to just potentially seal up those um, junctions initially anyway, but it's not necessarily... That, that's why everyone says you've got to have the lifestyle changes as well you've got to have the nutrient and 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 diet changes so that over time you might possibly come off the uh bhrt or reduce it um as we naturally start to reduce our hormones over time anyway um but it's super super important to start addressing what is actually creating that leaky gut in the first place what is creating the availability of those my, uh, those molecules going through into the bloodstream and starting to really be a precursor to the the inflammation, the brain fog, the um, insomnia, the you know, or, or the itchy skin, which is such a common one, isn't it? The, the yeah. Itchy, histamine. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. also, sorry, I was just going to say we, we kind of talk about the immune side of things, but kind of tying also you know, in terms of the gut brain connection via the vagus nerve, you know, that's separate, if you like to, it's not separate, because it's all to get all combined, it's all together. But it's another thing to think about is the gut brain connection. And if we've got healthy microbes, in our gut, you know, they synthesize serotonin, they synthesize GABA, you know, these things which progesterone helps with GABA and we're losing progesterone. What else can we turn to, to help us with that beautiful calming neurotransmitter? You know, our gut microbes are there to help us if we allow them. And if our car park is full of the nice ones, you know, they will help us by synthesizing GABA. And then they have a direct highway up to your brain via the vagus nerve, you know, a direct highway. So we can't underestimate the fact that our mood, brain fog, but low mood, anxiety, you know, it's so influenced by our microbes that are in our gut. And also, you know, the food that we're then feeding it and, you know, all, all everything else that goes with it. But that connection via the vagus nerve is really, really important. And things like, you know, being able to be in that parasympathetic nervous system, which we do when we're, you know, applying the yoga practices, when we're being mindful around our eating, you know, we're letting our body rest and digest, letting our microbes do their thing, you know, letting our, our digestive function eliminate the unhelpful stuff that we don't want to be recirculated and everything but we're allowing that vagal nerve to actually be flowing you know and that communication network between our microbes and our gut and our in our gut and our brain to be an open channel as opposed to being in a state of fight and flight and anxious and you know not being able to breathe and take things on and being overwhelmed so in the interesting, I mean, obviously we're talking about us, us midlife ladies and what's happening as we start to lose our hormones. But um, I'm thinking a lot of us have got teenage children or at least have teenagers, young people in our lives and how during that transition of hormones and flux, I mean, all of us know teenagers who are ridiculously stressed, suffering with panic attacks, you know, have anxiety problems and all the rest of it. And of course, the typical teenage diet is pasta and cheese and you know pizza etc cetera, etc cetera. i know that it's interesting a lot of my son's autistic friends um what they eat what they will eat is pasta and cheat carbohydrates and, yeah. and when you think when i'm you know he's listening to you now i'm like gotta just it just completely makes sense if if they're all suffering as well from this leaky gut and then yeah. the mood disorders, and then that going straight into the adrenals, pumping out those stresses. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, yes, we need to be thinking about us 
but golly, we, we, this is relevant for our teens as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and there's some fascinating areas of research now with um, kind of behavioural disorders in children and faecal microbial transplants. You know, it is a fascinating area of research where they can alter the behaviour of children who have perhaps been dismissed as so oh, just you know on the spectrum or like having these tr just troubled but not actually thinking hold on like let's see what's their microbiome look like and if we can take healthy really diverse microbiome samples and allow these children to have that you know how that then influences mood for many months afterwards it's amazing mind-blowing really but that is all to do with that communication via the vagus nerve between the brain and our microbes and what those are doing and reducing the inflammation and the brain being in an inflammatory state and how important that is so should we talk about what we can do then? Should we go through our little checklist of what we should do for good gut health? Absolutely, because Not I feel like my brain is frying a little bit here. So yes, oh, yeah. <laughs> let's just assume we've all got leaky gut. Yeah, it's okay. All right. Yes, we probably do. And, um, if, if you've ever used, uh, if you've ever used anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, you know they will pretty much kind of harm your gut. If you've ever drunk alcohol, if you've ever been stressed. <laughs> <laughs> you know so many of these things so anyway um yes so yeah please do yeah. tell us well, well, well we've <laughs> talked a little bit about, about oh, hi claire well. darling i'm just thanks thanks so much we'll just put you on on mute for the moment but we will have questions soon so we've spoken about our bowel function you know we want to be going to the toilet every day that's really important for it properly evacuating our bowels and if you've not if you're not doing this then have a look at are you are you very stressed you know because that's not going to be helping you at all when you're in a state of fight or flight you won't be able to go to the toilet properly um, but we also want to think about our posture and all of the things which you're learning about through your program Linda as well um, Fiber is really, really important. And we want to get a mix of fiber, soluble fiber and insoluble fiber is there in foods naturally. Like we can't really have an apple and not have, you know, just have soluble, just have insoluble, but both play a role in gut function. So good, good fiber is really important. It's a whole apple, isn't it? Not the apple juice. Just not the apple juice. I know a lot of people just do go, oh, I'm, I'm having a smoothie and therefore it's, yeah, a smoothie, I suppose, is better than a juice. Like, I mean, at least you've got the fiber in a smoothie. But when I see people have a glass of orange juice thinking it's a healthy choice for breakfast, I just hold my head in my hands and just say, like, right, you've, you, you would never eat 12 oranges in one go. You think about kind of the sugar hit that you're going to be getting straight into your gut that is only going to feed. So our more harmful bacteria love sugar. They really, really love sugar. The helpful bacteria love fiber. And you think of what is in an orange juice, you're not got any fiber in orange juice. So think really carefully about increasing the diversity of your, your plants that you're eating, you know, healthy loads of diversity with your your different spices and every single microbe likes something else to eat they're just like human beings you know we like our, we have our favorites so does our microbes so we want to be making sure you're getting the diversity in there so just sorry can you just speak a little bit more about that because I, I mean i know well i remember that thing with the bushmen um in africa and they had I don't know, something like five or six times the diversity of, or more than that, of, of different types of foods that they were eating in one day compared to the average British diet. Um, and, you know, thing, just knowing it's like, you know, your broccoli, all your crucifix vegetables, all of the different herbs, so dry herbs as well as um, fresh herbs, all play a very big role. But can yeah. you talk a little bit about the, you know, trying to get in the sort of, 30 plus different yeah, we should be aiming for 30 different ones and I I like to think you know when you so say for example you've got a um a dish that calls for an onion 
And in your bag that you picked up in when you were doing your grocery shopping, you've got uh, you've got shallots, you've got red onions, you've got white onions. You know, that's three. You use one of each. That's three different. They'll each have different components that will be helpful for different bacteria that are in your gut. So if something calls for, well, I just go crazy with throwing vegetables in everywhere and hiding them in everything if you've got fussy children as well because they won't know that a sweet potato has been mashed to nothing when it's a stew they can't see that there's a chunk of sweet potato in there so be be adventurous but you want to try and think about 30 different in the week 30 different types of plants we should aim for 50 but 30 i think is quite reasonable to, to do. So you go for the mixed berries as opposed to just the blueberries, for example. You know, you look at the different types of apples that we've got. You know, there's only one kind of banana, but there's about four or five different type of apples easily available in the shop. So don't always go for the pink lady, you know, get the different types of apples, get the different types of pears, you know, look at all your different herbs and spices in your, make it really easy and accessible for you when you're cooking have them all there and you say recipe calls for a bit of cumin just throw in a bit of cumin a bit of com cardamom a bit of cinnamon a bit of it yeah it's okay just use a bit of everything instead you it'll all taste amazing um but alongside that we also want to think about what we shouldn't really be eating and that largely is going to be our processed foods so we think about not just the fact that the processed foods are quite often stripped of fiber, they won't be very rich in fiber, which is going to fuel our microbiome. So they've also been stripped of a lot of the nutrients as well. So it's just kind of bulk and not a lot of goodness that goes with processed foods. But the kind of um, fats that they're likely to be using when they're making processed foods is not going to be your ultra good extra virgin olive oil you know for making the hummus it's probably going to be be vegetable oil or sunflower oil or palm oil or canola oil you know these things are all quite pro-inflammatory their their profile from a chemistry perspective is very high in an omega-6 fat which we don't want and our microbes don't want they're very pro inflammatory they can contribute to leaky gut they can contribute to dysbiosis so think about processed foods not just in terms of fiber but in terms of the more damaging fats that are more likely to come alongside them so they're the things we want and also thinking about other things we don't want to eat we don't want to eat too much too many foods that we know we react to so going back to your a1 casein and the gluten you know, if you find that it gives you a bit of abdominal discomfort, it's a sign, you know, you probably shouldn't be eating it. Your gut is telling you not happy with that right now. Right now, you know, who knows in the future might be fine, but be truthful to what your body is telling you when it comes to sensitivities around food, you know, and if alcohol is not agreeing with you and you get a headache or you feel groggy the next day, just leave the alcohol for a while, you know, let's just nurture our body and listen to what the body is saying it, it likes and it doesn't like and respect that right now. Um, I think that's a really big one for a lot of us, you know, and it is a bit of pulling on your big girl pants and saying, it, you know, if I'm losing a day or two after having a few glasses of wine with my girlfriends um, and I'm feeling so crappy, I can't function properly, and I'm awful to my family. Um, and now we know that we're also causing gut, you know, leaky gut to become worse. Then, um, you know, collectively, maybe we can just be going for this moment in my life at any rate, I'm just going to say no or re really be very conscious because, you know, our, our society still is very orientated around our cult, less so now than it was when we were younger, but, you know, it, it still is to a certain degree. And it takes, it takes conscious effort to be able to say you no know, and believe that you can still have a good time without a drink. But, um, you know, it, it, do, would you agree? Because I think it's so much of a psychological thing. I know, uh, you know, for me, before I had that breakdown, I, the thought of being the one in the party atmosphere who was going, oh, actually, no, 
was was hard whereas now I'm like my health is too important yeah and it is a, it's like a kind of age wisdom thing isn't it so yeah. I love that you have given us such a clear visual of what's actually happening to our gut lining when we drink mm. what's going to happen to that estrogen dominance and 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 that inflammation and that worsening of potential autoimmune yeah yeah and breast cancer you know, absolutely you know it's not we do, we want to make sure that we're doing the right things um and also i suppose not feeding is important as well mm. so you know we want to make sure we're eating the right things but having a period overnight where we're not feeding and we're not snacking you know allow ourselves to get good sleep because we're not digesting something that we really you know ate just before going to bed you know having that period and while we sleep I didn't really mention this but while we sleep magic happens like our gut has got its own diurnal activity going on it doesn't know if it's you know light or dark outside but it sure as hell knows what time it is and when it's nighttime that is when our microbes in our gut help us with all these housekeeping activities. You know, they switch on autophagy and mitophagy, which are these cellular activities that really help with reducing down inflammation. They help protect us against cancer because don't forget what cancer is, is like your immune system's not got on top of some cells which needed to be cleaned up. You know, so these period overnight of not feeding is really important. And we can, I think maybe we want to talk about fasting at some other time, but not eating is really good as well for our microbiome, you know, and, and I really stick to the rule of like, when you've had your meal time at night, say you finish at, I don't know, seven thirty, eight o'clock, you don't have anything then until breakfast the next day. You don't go back and have a look in the fridge at 10 you know you don't go and have something on the sofa at nine o'clock because you know that's what you've always done that's not helpful for your gut um and your overall health so yeah not feeding is just as important as what we're feeding a whole other talk if we can at some point about intermittent fasting because also just the fact that as women we need to do this differently as from men and that is such a huge topic um so it would be good if we could talk about that another time but uh, you know properly um yeah, but yes golly uh, you know uh, it's interesting because I'm thinking last night I didn't sleep very well and I woke up in the middle of the night before I was hungry and I know it was because I did I snacked before I went to I was you know because of a, a reason but yes it's so interesting mm -hmm. isn't it when you start to go there is a pattern and there is a reason why. And I know when I don't and when I am conscious of getting that 13, 14 hours of just letting my gut rest, how much clearer I am and how much more energy I have. It's yeah, it is magic, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah. yeah, let them do their job. You know, let the let our microbes do the job that they need to do. Let our body function do what we need to do. You know, constant snacking throughout the day is only going to feed microbes in areas that we don't really want them, you know, in our small intestine is very much been linked to frequent snacking. So we need to like go back to our roots of how we used to eat, you know, not snacking all the time. Make sure you have a really fulfilling breakfast, lunch, supper, you know, with healthy fat and protein and fiber in every single one of those meals. And then you won't need to be eating in between the meals. You'll feel really nicely satiated and you'll allow the metabolic processes to work so much more efficiently if they're not having to kind of deal with blood sugar spikes and highs and lows and, and, and things like that and sending messages to the brain that you're hungry because, well, actually you probably didn't eat the right things in your previous meal. So, mm. Um, mm. so, so I think we're all probably going, oh my goodness, okay, right, we need to sort this out. So in an night, if we were all you're sitting in front of you and you're know, a private client and you and we're in and we're about to leave and you're gonna say, right, for this week at least, I, I want you to start focusing on 
this is an ideal breakfast maybe this is a gut healing broth or something and you know this is a lunch tell us what should we have I know we did talk about this in the previous talk a bit but what should we have on our plate what should we be including um I think for a lot of women especially the protein is a bit of a, a thing we're not so sure and, and the good fats um to 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 start to actively heal that gut and to into um yeah, the gut biome yeah yeah well I haven't really touched on stress but stress is going to if you're if you are stressed it will really inhibit everything that I'm about to say so first of all we really need to make sure that we're not eating on the fly that we're not rushing and going that we're taking time to eat because if we if we are in a rush or if we're stressed or we're late or you know we're, we've got shouty with the kids or whatever we won't digest properly we won't be secreting enough stomach acid to kick off our whole digestive process so stress is probably the number one thing that I would say to just make sure you're doing before you're about to look at your beautiful plate in front of you you know so you know the old practice of just sitting at a table not eating on the go you know don't eat in your car you know eating in a state of rest and digest is really important so presumably you're doing that because i'm honoring I, and i guess it's that whole you know giving thanks for the plate in front of you as well when you're in that state of gratitude thankfulness calm yeah. appreciation yeah that in itself is going to help you digest yeah definitely definitely so then talking about what's on your plate and we touched on this last time so if you imagine your plate is nice and round um it's easy to think about so half of it should really be some lovely um vegetables some plants because that's what's going to help your microbiome so i think diversity is really important here but it's not difficult if you've got a little bit of planning so for example um last night the oven was on so i threw in a butternut and a cauliflower and all the cauliflower greens and that's then me sorted for a few lunches if i'm stuck to know what else to throw in with a salad for example i know that i've got my mixed salad a little bit of pre-packaged beetroot um some sweet potato and some cauliflower with a whole load of different spices and garlic that i threw on that's like seven in just my side portion for lunch today so out of my 30 for the week I've hit seven in one day and then I might throw on you know some yeah I might throw on some za'atar or you know some other spices as well just to you know add to it protein is it it depends we we probably don't eat enough protein if I'm honest I see so many women who are really under nourishing themselves with protein and it's it's easier to make sure you're getting the right amount of protein if you're an omnivore diet if you're following a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet it needs more thought around it but that's not to say it can't be done and you know discovering the likes of tempeh and tofu and all of those soy products if you are vegan is really really helpful because of their estrogenic type profile that they have for us as well so that's always a good um kind of protein source nuts i'm a massive fan of mixed bags of nuts so again i in my breakfast today i didn't just have almonds i buy the mixed pack that have got almonds pecans walnuts macadamia nuts uh cashew nuts uh brazil nuts you know like the six <laughs> and I have a really, really generous handful of that with my breakfast. And you, you about... put, them the, put them in the freezer, which I thought was the best thing. Nuts in the freezer, yummy. freezer, ladies. Yeah. Oh, it'll change your life. Change your life. It's a game changer, isn't it? It's, it's they're so good. Yeah, and they won't get rancid. Yeah. You know, this is the thing. You don't want them to get damaged. Like they oxidize quite because of their fat content. They oxidize. So um, eggs. Uh, pretty much daily will be there if you can eat eggs if you can eat milk cheese is really good 
butter is really good you know so thinking about that but I I eat meat so we make sure that we get not just one cut of meat you know I'm quite adventurous with trying organ meats as well because they're really good for us really really good for us very rich in b vitamins and um vitamin a as well so they're 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 quite good for us if you can um I feel and you, I try I tried liver I used to have it when I was little with my mum making it with bacon right it wasn't bad but I had liver recently at a roast thing and I was thinking oh um you know Nick would be proud I'm gonna have the whole big big portion of this liver god it was disgusting it was so disgusting right. but but I know yeah. I mean no, I was because it's full of iron isn't it it's so it's so good but I think certainly yeah. it can be the taste can be hidden can't it yeah uh, yeah it can be hidden so chopping it up really really small and putting it in a bolognese and the kids wouldn't even notice you know things like that just be really be think a little bit outside the box about where we're going to be sneaking these things in it's not something you want to have every day um but you know once a week once every couple of weeks heart is quite good as well but I don't want to put off like vegetarian people um so anyway <laughs> i see poor helen cringing um so yeah there so think about your protein sources and fats are really important for us as well they'll make you feel full because of what they do to your hormones in your in your gut um but they're really important our basis of our communications of the you know cells communicating from one to another it's all to do around how well you've got fat integrated into your cells. So you want to have your omega-3 fats, your fish, you know, all the different kinds of fish. Fall back in love with mackerel, tin sardines, salmon. Um, they're all really healthy. But also avocado is really nice, you know. Um, so and and egg has got some fat in it as well so th think about those sources of what that might might look like um and coconut what oil. else yeah and coconut oil on everything <laughs> what was that sorry coconut oil and 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 quality olive oil I always try and drizzle it on everything now getting much more you know much better I think at trying to be more Mediterranean in approach to yeah cooking. Yeah. And the Mediterranean diet pyramid, if you've ever seen it, you know, it is it has been so well studied in relation to longevity, cardiovascular health, overall good health and well-being. And at the foundation is your vegetables and your diversity of your vegetables. I suppose kind of all around that is the community and eating with friends and eating with family, you know, because then you are in that state of rest and digest. So that's kind of under pillars, everything. And then, you know, the, the Mediterranean diet, loads of extra virgin olive oil, lots of water to be well hydrated, occasional glass of wine, just for that community aspect to it as well. So, um, and hardly any of the cakes the pastries the sugars you know these things are right at the top of that little pyramid you want to have them very rarely um so yeah look up the mediterranean pyramid it's really it's a nice graphic for us to visualize what we should be doing very different from the one that we grew up with isn't it with the with the whole base of bread and you know, so yeah. yeah um amazing nick i feel like we've we've sort of you know, you've given us a really good eye-opening overview of just how unbelievably important the gut biome is. Um, I know I want to go and do more research now myself, um, but definitely have been inspired to make sure that I, you know, think about that, keeping the eating between a, a window during the day and um, making sure I, I you know, get in even more vegetables, the, the good fiber, um, keeping that hydration up, you know, getting that good protein, especially I know with breakfast is really important. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, just looking after, I mean, I'm, I'm a big one for, for broth. So as well, I'm going to get some yes. broth going uh, for healing. Yeah. Um, so if there's anything else you want to say now, otherwise, if, if ladies, if there's anyone who's got a question for nick in particular please just take yourself off 
mute and and ask away. Uh, Nick, you haven't you haven't mentioned any grains or chickpeas or any things like that. Where where do they come into? Is that yeah. a plant? That would be a plant. So your legumes, so chickpeas, um, chickpeas, lentils, le legumes, so beans, pinto beans, black beans. These are all really helpful. These are all got high amounts of fiber that will be nourishing your gut. So some people find that they if they have got a, an imbalance in gut bacteria, then some unhelpful bacteria actually ferment some of those foods a little bit. And if you feel that you have got any bloating in the few hours after eating chickpeas or any of those kind of bean type foods, either try soaking them first because it will decrease the lectin content that is causing that bloating, but also then look at your gut dysbiosis and whether you might have some gut dysbiosis going on there because it's unhelpful bacteria that will be fermenting and leading you know producing gases and leading to the bloating but most people should be able to to tolerate um, that but they yes Helen they firmly fit into the fiber side of things grains on the other hand you know grains are things like um wheat and barley and rye and spelt so these things are also fiber but the way in which they've been processed these days is something to pay attention to because if they have been overly processed in terms of your white bread or white pasta you know that's going to not have any of the fiber so you know we as a family I've got young kids they love a bit of pasta but I tend to go for the whole grain pasta or the spelt pasta purely on the fiber side of things. So you know that it's going to be adding a little something to the microbiome rather than the white pastas, which are devoid of, of most of that. I, I really love this whole concept actually of, you know, as women, we, we are naturally very, you know, sort of caring, but if you're thinking you're now you're caring for this microbiome, like it's a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you need to be doing the things to make this microbiome as happy and healthy as possible yeah 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 interesting any other questions no yes helen another one <laughs> oh you're on mute helen oh helen you're on mute um just out of interest being a mum of teenagers uh, the alcohol and the the, the joint uh, the front the tight junctions yes um you know obviously that affects us now that we're in midlife it affects us a lot more when you're younger can you just get away with it for a while or does it start can you start to unknowingly introduce something that's going to stay more long term and and that will develop and, and manifest later in life um because you know <laughs> Uh, my son doesn't want to drink and he's going off to university and is surrounded by this pressure to drink um and it'd just be interesting for him to to know well actually no you know this is what it's going to do long term to me or does it not really do a long-term damage when you're that age i i i can't honestly say what it does long term because i think everybody's very different in terms of how they respond to alcohol and how they metabolize alcohol. And it's all down to the overall health of the liver um, because that's really the organ that is there to help clean up alcohol when you're eating, when you're drinking it. But I wouldn't say, I mean, we've all, we've all been there, um, you know, and, and drunk to excess in our youth and, live to survive the tale I'm not a, an advocate of doing it and now I've got the knowledge of how alcohol when we metabolize it, it really depletes us of zinc in particular and we think about how you have a heavy night and then quite often you're poorly and the role there between your zinc stores having been massively depleted and zinc being so important for your immune cells so you when you learn a bit more so I suppose what you could do with your son is just kind of go in there armed with the tools of and with the knowledge that he needs to try and just eat as much good stuff as as well as he can to make sure that he's not kind of putting a pressure on his liver with toxins 
um, so that the liver can do the job that it wants to for clearing up the alcohol maybe talk to him about making sure he's getting lots of zinc rich foods as well like it's quite a good post uh you know for the the next day just being make, making sure that you've got the right nutrients there to help you with those knock-on effects um good multivitamin um suffice if you're in a situation where you're you know in halls where you don't necessarily have great food being cook for you i'm not sure helen what your son's going to be doing but you know could, could you do that in the circumstance yeah i mean a, a multivitamin i see as like a great insurance policy for everybody like even if we eat the best diet in the world our nutrients in the soil are so depleted these days anyway that are we going to be getting everything that we need Probably not. And I, I think certainly for teens, maybe fussy eaters, a multivitamin is a really good insurance policy. I probably wouldn't go for like a multivitamin from the supermarket, which would be loaded in fillers, you know, get it from a responsible outlet that's got good quality. You, you know, you do to a degree get what you pay for when it comes to vitamins and minerals. But I think that that would be a helpful insurance policy when you're looking at a diet generally and making sure they've got their manganese and their copper and their zinc and their B vitamins, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, my, mine's gone to university this year, my oldest, and um, he wasn't much of a drinker before, um, but he's sort of found a balance. He's drinking more, but he's um, when he's at home, he doesn't drink at all. So the whole Easter holidays, although he's come to the pub with us and things, didn't touch a drop. And um, and he only drinks on about three nights a week. So he's kind of finding his balance. But he says it, he's autistic, too. And he finds it really helps sort of oil the social wheels for him. Um, he says he finds it easier to converse and chat to people. So, you know, pros and cons. But I sent him off with multivitamins, too, because the food is, you know, he is one of those ones that lives on carbs and cheese and stuff. But he's quite health conscious. He's got some food issues but he really does want to eat healthily and um and he cooks when he does cook he's in catered halls at the moment but when he does cook he cooks mm. quite well balanced so yeah Not just it's... Passionate. i mean i think just knowing this stuff and good for us to teach our teens you know about the gut biome and things or i don't know let them listen to this um because once you understand, I mean, I didn't, I didn't even think about it when I was younger. I, I would just eat whatever everybody else was eating. I did my main thing was I didn't want to be different, I guess. So yeah, that's a big influence, isn't it? When you're younger, when you get to middle age, it's more like you know, bollocks to that. It's but when you're a teenager, much more, much yeah. more self-conscious. Absolutely. But, you know, I think if you understand, crikey, the reason I've got such bad headaches or brain fog or, you know, potentially all my aches and pains, et cetera, or really bad bloating or, you know, mm -hmm. even some of the anxiety and mood issues could be because I literally need to not have. Yeah. Every day. And, and let's see what happens if if I actually listen to mum and have, you know, focus this on it. If you, uh, it, and yeah and you understand the why you're more likely to do it and I you know I've got a 12 year old son who has an autoimmune condition which is in a in remission at the minute but you know I constantly remind him about why he needs to eat the diversity of the vegetables why he shouldn't be eating the sugary sweets you know I don't want his arthritis to come back you don't want him to go back to hospitals and so he hopefully is learning through all of this and the con you know the constant reminders but when the when kids and adolescents they understand what what is causing what they're much more likely to listen and take action rather than it being just mum is telling me I shouldn't drink a sugary drink you know mm. understand what is going to happen if they do you know and can consistently do these things you know that's mm. the thing amazing so, so ladies, what's been the most interesting or eye-opening thing that you've heard um, today? You know, I want to contribute and just say what you've found, you know, new, something you didn't know before.
for me, I think it's just being aware that these things exist, the mic microbes and what their, what their job is and how it's our job to make that easy for them. It's kind of, yeah, I didn't really know about them and uh, I want to look after them better now. That's mm. lovely, Helen. For mm. me, um, I kind of knew quite a lot of it because I've been following a particular um, healthy eating plan and following the work of Tim Spector and Zoe as well. Um, but the thing about the oestrogen, and I, I've been aware people say, oh, oestrogen is what makes you get middle-aged spread and deposits of fat around your organs and things, but I didn't really understand why before. So, so um, yeah, that's interesting too. Oh, mm. super, Alison. Mm. Anyone else? No, I, I, I've got to say, for me, the thing that I'm really interested in is the autoimmune you know, when we look at the unbelievable uh, acceleration in autoimmune dis disorders, um, a lot uh, in midlife and, and also obviously breast cancer and, you know, that being uh, definitely attributable to the imbalance of estrogen. Um, but thinking about often our kids as well. I know so many kids who, you know, suddenly type two diabetes, et cetera, uh, type one diabetes, sorry. Um, and, yeah, so that's mm. that's very interesting, and and endometriosis, the you know, golly, the painful periods, and and even endo. Um, mm. Yeah, that's no, good takeaways, isn't it? You know about that communication with the immune system and the guts. It's really vital. So, mm. so we're gonna eat our broccoli. Oh, yeah. <laughs> eat our broccoli. <laughs> Get our good fats in. Make sure you go to the toilet properly. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Nick. I really appreciate you coming and speaking to us. It's been superb. Um, could you just tell everybody how they can find you, please? Yeah, super. I'm So I'm over on Instagram and on Facebook. If you, you use either of those, uh, it's at NV Health UK. Um, and I post there quite regularly and I've got a website as well with a newsletter where kind of every month or so, well, yeah, about every month I send out some information. Um, I've covered things like collagen, what's the buzz about all of that, toxic products in your home, look at everything to do with nutrition and lifestyle medicine, really. Um, so most welcome to join me over there. And I, I do one to one consultations as well to look at specific individual health concerns. Um, but I always love talking about anything to do with nutrition. So I'm very much uh, loving being a part of this as well to share the knowledge. I'm gonna go on a bit of a journey myself with Nick, having had quite a history of gut issues in my past, getting a bit better now that I'm paying attention to the micro <laughs> microbiome. But um, so I will let you know how I go, cause I'm gonna do, you know, next process and um and see if i can really clean up the the microbiome garden if you if you like so yeah i'm very happy to share a bit of my journey and um you guys might learn a little bit from from that as well that'd be great oh all right ladies Super. have a lovely day thank have you thank you, thank you very much thank you so much thank you bye